All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, virtually for the Matheson History Museum. Um, we are really pleased to be able to welcome back Dr. Kimberly Wilmot Voss, um, who is a professor at the University of Central Florida. And she is going to be sharing with us today about Florida's fashion history. Um, and if you are interested in uh, women's history, I encourage you to join us again for our next program, um, which will be a curator's talk for our exhibition, Trailblazers, 150 Years of Alachua County Women. And that will be taking place April 2nd at 4 p.m., both in person and online. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Voss, for being here. And uh, go ahead and take it away. Great. Um, thank you so much for coming today. One of my favorite things to do is talk about women journalists in Florida because they were such a significant part, um, particularly of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, Florida fashion. Um, previously, I've talked about women in politics at the Matheson um, and women who covered Florida food. Um, so just briefly, Newspapers um, used to have what was called the women's pages, quite literally. That's what it was called above the fold, a special section. Um, they started in the 1880s um, and they stayed in Metro newspapers through about uh, the late 60s, early 1970s. And you'll notice here it's all women in this room. This is the New York Times. And they would put women in a separate room and often on a separate floor uh, to make sure that they didn't mix with the men. There was a concern that um, these women journalists couldn't handle cursing, um, which was not true. They curse as much as anybody else. But um, in this special space of theirs, they came up with their own definition of news um, and really changed things, particularly after World War II. During World War II was the first time that women journalists could cover any section of the newspaper other than really sports. And so they changed the definition of news, strengthened it, um, and included things that had never been covered before. I specialize um, largely in Florida news. Um, the Miami Herald was one of the most significant newspapers um, at the time. In the 1950s, they were a statewide newspaper. Um, so this is their newsroom. Here you can see all the women who are there and, and some of the most important women that covered um, women's clubs and fashion, advice columns, food are all in this room. And women that were in the women's pages came from a variety of places. Um, some of them had home economics degrees. Um, some of them had journalism degrees. Um, almost all of them had gone to college um, with the assumption that they would have a career. Sometimes we hear that home ec degrees um, were to be better wives or mothers, but most of the women I've looked at really did plan to go into the work, paid workforce um, after college. So the women's sections um, really consisted largely of the four Fs, family, furnishings, food, and fashion. And it's what really many historians, um, if they cover women at all, um, call fluff which to me always seems problematic because these are four things I think matter to everybody, right? What you eat, what you wear, where you live, um, and the people that you surround yourself with. So today I'm gonna to talk about fashion and sometimes because it's often a, a woman's interest in the 1950s and 1960s, fashion is considered insignificant. Um, it's frivolous to care what you look like, but there were a lot of issues um, that fashion included. It, it was employment. Um, it was part of the economy. Uh, as I'll talk about today, it was about gender and social issues. Wearing pants um, was a really a, quite a big fight um, for nearly two decades. There are stories in the newspaper about um, women that would wear um, pants to a restaurant and get kicked out, or they would wear pants to court and get arrested. So it was not a small thing, it was significant. And as we see social change in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly as we see from a time of tradition and conformity to times of questioning, it was often reflected in fashion. And every major newspaper um, had a fashion editor. And so this not only gave um, the fashion editor a career, 
outside of the home, she traveled a lot, a lot. Um, there were international fashion shows, there were local fashion shows. And so these women really um, had a chance to tell their home audiences what mattered. Um, and it, it was hard work. They would go to these fashion shows. Um, the ones in New York would take days and they had to send back several stories every day from the fashion shows. Um, so it, it was real work. Um, so just briefly about Florida women's pages. Um, in the 1960s, these newspaper sections were very strong. The Penny Missouri Awards were the top awards for best women's sections. Um, women were not allowed to be part of, say, Pulitzer Prizes. Um, they couldn't be members of the Society of Professional Journalists. So the Penny Missouri Awards were a pretty big deal. Um, during that first decade, the 1960s, Florida newspapers won one third of the awards. Um, and part of it was also how big these newspapers were. In this consumer culture, beginning in the 1950s, um, these women's sections were very, very thick. Um, they could be dozens of pages, um, along with special sections, magazine sections. And so there's a lot of content that needed to be produced, as well as the fact that uh, Florida and South Florida specifically um, were becoming um, strong in the sportswear industry. By um, the end of World War II, as tourism increased, particularly as um, soldiers had served in the servicemen's pier in Miami, came back in peacetime, um, they relocated um, into the Tampa and Miami area. And so um, they that, that increased the tourism and it meant that suddenly there was more um, sportswear to be had and suddenly there was a voice and, and a place for even other fashion reporters to come to Florida to write about fashion. Um, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, there were these special sections that these women also produced. Um, this is 40 years of fashion coverage um, in the Miami Herald. And I should say that in addition to fashion such as clothing or shoes, um, these women also covered hairstyles uh, of a time period when um, you either embraced tradition or was a big deal not to. Uh, they also covered skincare. So there was a lot of coverage of um, sunscreen or lack thereof um, in Florida, um, as well as dietary issues, nutrition. So it was looked at quite broadly um, when you look at what fashion coverage was. It, it wasn't just what you were wearing, um, although we'll talk about that today. Um, it was a very broad selection um, of what was in the, uh, the fashion coverage. Um, so here's an example um, of what the, uh, the fashion section might look like. You'll notice um, it's very gray. We don't have a lot of white space and that's what most of the sections had looked like. There were pictures, a lot of ads that were in the section. Of course, the advertising is what paid for um, the size of the section, the very first thing you do in a newspaper is lay out the advertising. And a lot of that advertising um, would come from say department stores, local boutiques. Um, and so those were the things that kind of created the foundation of the women's section and particularly um, fashion. <clears throat> so these are the kinds of things that you would find in your 1950s and 60s fashion sections in newspapers. And this gave um, women in the women's section expertise in a way that they couldn't otherwise. They could only work in a women's section. There were rarely any spots for women in say politics, um, in the opinion section, um, definitely not in sports. And so having their own space where they could say, this is what women want, this is what matters, were a big deal. Um, I love one of these um, quotes from the American Press Institute in 1951. In fashion newspapers, it was noted, no aspect of the news is further from the comprehension of the average male editor than fashion. And there was a similar concept um, for the other parts of the women's section. And this meant that they could really um, take a stand. They would push back if, say, uh, a department store demanded that a story would run. Um, they would say that that's not what, you know, their local readership wanted to see. So it really did give them um, a kind of expertise in journalism that they didn't have in any other part of the newspaper, and frankly wouldn't have um, for quite a while. As I mentioned, the women's sections um, were eliminated in the late 60s, um, the early 1970s under the, um, the theory, the concept 
that women were hired in other parts of the newspaper. And it was a great idea, um, but it didn't happen in practice. So really the 1950s and 60s for women, when it came to soft news, uh, was a very important time, um, what is sometimes called the golden era um, of the women's pages. They gave a lot of talks. Um, when I went through the news sections, um, here's a talk about a woman um, from the Miami Daily News uh, who was speaking about resort wear for the spring. Newspapers um, across the country would often sponsor talks because of this expertise I mentioned that um, the women who went to say these fashion shows um, or interviewed um, designers knew things that others didn't um, and say they're commonly asked to speak um, at community talks, particularly the women's pages, which really kind of raised their stature, both in their community um, and in their publication. So much of what I was able to find um, about the fashion editors and the women's page folks came from the National Women in Media Collection. Um, this is located in Missouri. This was established by a Florida women's page journalist turned publisher by the name of Marjorie Paxson. So she um, retired from Gannett. She was the fourth uh, female publisher of the Gannett um, chain, which does Florida Today and USA Today. And so she gave part of her um, retirement funds to establish this so I could actually read the letters and see um, the clips that these women had. And I often mention to my students, I teach journalism history at UCF, um, that one of the stories that Marjorie used to tell, um, she was at the Miami Herald and also at the St. Pete Times. Um, she told the story that when she eventually became a publisher, that um, and this was out West, she had bought a bunch of um, very ladylike professional dresses so she could be um, the significant, right, um, women's publisher. But when she got there, um, the women asked her, and this is in 1982, would she allow women to wear pants? And she couldn't believe that women weren't allowed to wear pants. And that was all women at the newspaper. So the next day she went um, to a department store to buy a pantsuit so she could show the women that it was okay. And um, the woman um, who looked at her, her credit card said, so many women are coming in today because we've learned that they're gonna be able to wear pants. And again, that's 1982 um, pants were a significant thing that I'll talk about today that um, really was pushed back, not only in the workplace, but socially, um, in terms of saying what it meant to be feminine and what it meant to be powerful in the workplace. Um, there's also some nice primary sources and some archives I was able to find to see what exactly it was that women in fashion journalism were doing, um, because it, it was as, um, Significant as political reporters, um, sports reporters, who are often considered their equivalent in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you'll notice there on the bottom, 1952, the South Florida Regional Group is established. Um, and there were so many stories about women um, who are kind of on the margins finding where they were because they weren't accepted in typical journalism organizations. Um, but the work they did was very important um, and as much journalism as anything else. Um, they'd worked a lot in photos. They typically couldn't take photos, but they could oversee photo shoots. So here's um, a Miami story, six ways to wear a dress. And so um, often when these women went to fashion shows, um, they sometimes traveled with a, a photographer from the newspaper, but often didn't. So they'd have to reach out to um, other the newspaper that was in town um, or other local photographers who would take pictures because of course fashion is a very visual aspect of journalism. Um, and so they often had to do not just reporting and writing, but do the visual element, um, figuring out what kind of photos. Um, and sometimes that included also finding local models for their photo shoots. Back in the day, uh, talking about particularly in the 1950s, um, these newspaper sections, um, um, the fashion sections also included sewing and home economics. Many newspapers actually had um, patterns that were in, this, in their sections. Um, if they didn't have it in their sections, you could send in a quarter and um, an envelope and you could have it sent to you. So part of what was happening in terms of different kind of social class issues 
was you had these women that were shopping at um, fancy department stores, um, working with designers, and some that could not afford that. And so they were often sewing um, their own clothing. And this was particularly common for children. A lot of these fashion sections would have special sections, say once a month um, or every once in a while for children's clothing. And kind of the expectation was that someone was sewing it. Um, I'm guessing that in some situations it was household help um, more than necessarily um, the mother, but you certainly saw um, the concept of sewing common in the fashion sections of the 1950s that through this, the 1960s would kind of um, lose its way. Um, one of my favorite fashion writers in Florida was Jill Warney. She won the Penny Missouri Award, as I mentioned earlier, um, that really showed the best in the women's pages and they had a special fashion award. Um, Jill won hers in 1972. Um, she uh, was in the 4-H, uh, raised on an Ohio farm. She was given the choice um, in high school of learning to sew or raising a hog. Um, and she said that sewing sounded much more appealing. Um, she described in her Penny Missouri acceptance um, that she saw sewing as a hobby that was therapy um, after being in front of a typewriter all day. Her story um, was looking at various places in Miami um, that were producing fabrics because she was um, looking for cheaper, uh, inexpensive fabrics at the time. So she found this booming polyester knitting industry in Miami. Um, the article was polyester, a new $70 million business. Um, and she described what polyester was, which is new for many readers at the time. She had gone to fabric mills, interviews the workers that were there, um, and explained what was changing um, with the Cuban workforce in Miami at the time. And the judges who were all newspaper editors um, were very laudatory about her work. Um, and there's many letters um, back and forth between Joe and some of the folks, um, the Penny Missouri Award that showed how much they cared for her, uh, her reporting. So wearing pants um, was kind of where I first came into covering um, fashion journalism. And it almost seems um, quaint now, um, particularly when I have a lot of students that wear pajamas to class. Um, but wearing pants was a real big question. Um, and then, for decades, but um, what I'm looking at here in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, here was an article from 1969. The headline in the New York Times was, girls in pants aren't sent to the principal's office anymore. Um, because this was a significant issue. Um, women couldn't wear pants to work. I mean, I mentioned to you early, it was 1982 for Marjorie Paxson, um, but most newspapers didn't allow women to wear pants. Um, even industries where women dominated, um, uh, the Revlon company, for example, uh, most of the makeup companies would not let women wear pants to work, which was considered very threatening. Um, there were um, Bible verses that were cited um, that talked about how um, problematic it would be if women wore pants in public. Um, a pastor um, after World War II mentioned um, wearing uh, pants are immoral. And so there was this very um, value laden concept about wearing pants. Um, the only time that women were allowed to wear pants, if you looked at most of the news coverage, um, was when ri they were riding horses or riding bikes. So those were the two act kind of physical activities that were allowed, um, but it, it really became um, the question of what was acceptable. When I looked at some of the fashion articles, I noticed when um, pants were kind of starting to sneak in to fashion um, and often they were uh, described in their early years as um, divided skirts. They were pants, but they were described as um, divided skirts as a way of kind of um, becoming more acceptable. Um, here's a story about how restaurants um, cave before the pant suit onslaught um, started. So most um, restaurants would not allow women to wear pants. And so it was a real push to the point that some restaurants would just rather not have um, any women at all. A pushback on this that came up and one of the fashion editors from Michigan to kind of prove her point, they wouldn't let her in wearing pants to a restaurant. So she went back wearing her nightgown. 
um, which ended up a story that ended up winning a lot of awards, but they let her in in her nightgown. That was more socially acceptable than the idea of wearing pants. Um, and so the, the threat of this idea of women wearing something that was masculine and questioning gender roles uh, was clearly related to the concept of pants. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of stories in different newspapers across the country, including Florida, about this question um, of wearing pants and how um, it was considered problematic in most public places, like I said, other than some physical activities uh, where women could kind of justify it. Um, another interesting thing, um, particularly in the 1960s, um, I mentioned earlier that polyester was a new fabric that became in question that was kind of being explained. Um, paper clothes were common in the 1960s. So this is an ad that ran in the newspaper um, where you, the idea was you'd wear um, these paper clothes and then throw them away. And um, this, um, there were wedding dresses that were paper, uh, shoes that were paper. It, it, it was a, a common concept that you certainly don't really hear about today. Um, this idea of paper as a fabric was something um, that was significant. The space age um, was also important. And we see this kind of in food at that time period too, right? We talk about tang or we talk about um, dehydrated food. We saw a similar concept when it came to fashion. And so you had these kind of um, leather, um, kind of almost a latex looking kind of um, fabric. And so this idea um, of being very new agey um, was coming up when it came to clothes. This is also a, a time where we saw clothes as an individual. In the 1950s, it was often said you wanted to dress like your mother. Um, by the time you get to the 1960s, we see a real push away from that concept. Um, people aren't making their clothes anymore, they're buying them. Um, kind of this youth quake um, was coming about. And so you saw a real change and the idea that you could do something different, which you certainly didn't see um, kind of in the 1940s and the 1950s. You also saw this idea that fashion was personal. Um, the woman here who's speaking, uh, her name is Edie Green. She was the um, women's page editor at the Fort Lauderdale News. And um, a lot of her papers um, are at um, in the Petty Missouri collection in Missouri. And um, she had a, she was kind of a, um, she didn't describe herself as a feminist, but she certainly acted as one. She helped um, create uh, one of the first um, domestic violence shelters um, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and she certainly fought for women. She talked a lot about identifying um, with giraffes because they stuck their neck out to make a difference. And so I was looking at one of her, uh, her letters uh, that she'd written to the Penny Missouri people. And she had a PS at the end. And she said, I wore pants to work today with a smiley face. And I went and looked um, and it was Women's Equality Day. So there were these women that also, um, in addition to covering fashion, had elements that applied to them, whether it was wearing pants, um, whether it was um, kind of pushing back against the ethics of department stores that wanted their PR materials run verbatim versus asking questions if it was really possible. Um, another one of my favorite fashion editors was from Milwaukee. And um, Eileen Ryan, she was in Milwaukee and she really pushed back on this concept of um, mini skirts, right? Which was a big part of um, that we'll talk about yet. Um, not because she had a problem with how they looked but it was just too cold in Wisconsin to be wearing mini skirts um, in the winter. And I think she was right. Um, so another thing that was kind of happening um, that was building in the 1960s was in addition to the department stores, which again, really helped fund the sections in large part. Um, and of course, also helped with their buyers decide what fashions were significant, um, were boutiques as we had smaller places that were beginning to open up. Um, we had for the first time um, name brand designers, something that really kind of hadn't been done before. Um, also, particularly in Central and South Florida, you had a lot of first storage places. And that's something that you also see fashion changing about. There certainly wasn't a question um, if you should wear fur. 
when it came to the 50s and 60s. In fact, fur was considered a status symbol, right? Um, and so you had a lot of these ads for storage places where you take your fur, uh, it was refrigerated buildings, you would send them your clothes to um, in the summer. And then eventually we kind of see this um, question about wearing animal fur kind of change by the time we get to the early 70s. Department stores, um, and you know, we see a lot of department stores going under right now, but these really were important places. Each one of these department stores had regular fashion shows. So you could go in, um, often um, eat a meal and watch the fashion show and then decide if that's what you were gonna buy. And by the end of that fashion show, you could do that. So there would be like runways, say throughout the restaurant that the department stores would have. Um, and so, you know, um, Berdeens is known as the Florida store. And so there was this kind of very um, tropical-esque um, kinds of clothing. Um, Jordan Marshall was another popular one um, that again, that we see in Florida, they had the department, they had the, um, the advertising, they had the fashion shows, they were significant. But one thing I think is always important when we talk about department stores of this era of, of the 1950s and 1960s, is that although they wanted women to shop there, women were considered set, uh, second class citizens in many ways. Um, here's a letter from Roxy Bolton um, to Burton. She also wrote one um, to Jordan Marsh. Because of the policies that these two um, department stores had, and many did, uh, Fort Lauderdale did too, um, specifically, that women could not eat lunch at these places when men did. So they couldn't eat, say, between um, 11 and 1. And some of them would actually even call them the men's lunchroom. And the idea here was that women were so chatty and flighty, they'd get in the way. They would take too long to eat. So um, Roxy pushed to have both department stores, which they eventually did, get rid of that policy. But there was a real kind of um, you know, complex dynamic there between the idea that women were often um, spending the family um, budget at department stores, they couldn't eat there. Um, and quite often a married woman could not have a credit card from the department store without their husband's approval. So it was very complex and you definitely see the foundation where women were beginning to question their place um, in society in that late 60s, early 1970s. Um, this is Eleanor, um, Rattel is often known as Eleanor Hart. Um, so here she's um, writing about young Miami designers in the Miami Herald. She had a, um, a column um, that was um, column with a heart. And within that, she also had a diet column. And she, um, I've gone through her papers in Miami. Um, and so you can kind of see the back and forth that she did. Sometimes you'll see um, advice columnists say your local version of um, Dear Abby. Um, or Ann Landers, and they'll have kind of fake names at the end. Um, uh, oh, mother from the South or uh, sunshine wife, you know, just kind of random things. Um, but when you look through Eleanor's papers, those were real people because she would have their real names, their addresses, um, and often their phone numbers right there. Um, Eleanor really fought with her weight throughout her lifetime. Um, and so she wrote a lot of... Um, columns and stories about women who lost out of weight, who had makeovers, that sort of thing. Um, they mentioned in her obituary um, that she was sometimes, you could overhear her say, well, how fat are you anyway? Um, and again, she struggled with her own weight um, and she wrote a lot about the diets of the time, um, that sort of thing. But there really was a wide ranging definition of what was um, fashion. This of course was a time when Weight Watchers was first catching on. So I wanted to kind of um, finish by talking about some of the specific um, clothing um, outside of pants. I love this photo. These are people at the beach um, in Palm Beach in the 1900s. And you can see what they're wearing, right? They, um, for one thing, it's way more crowded than I would have imagined, um, but they have these full hats on. Um, they're wearing full clothing, um, even their swimsuits, which were then usually called swim costumes. Um, were very heavy. Uh, and really the idea here in large part was not to show any kind of skin. It was a very modest idea um, and just looks incredibly hot. 
um, when I first started doing research about Florida, I would notice in a footnote sometimes um, it would say BAC, and it took me a while to figure out that meant um, before air conditioning, which of course changed how people dressed, how they saw themselves. But there were so many regulations having to do with swimsuits. Um, the first woman to wear a, a swimsuit that wasn't kind of these overriding um, kind of um, this extra material in their clothing that, that just kind of wore something that looked really like a t-shirt and pants um, were these women that were competitive swimmers, the woman that swam the English Channel. Um, she wore this suit that, again, would look by today's standards very modest, um, but she happened to wear this that looked, again, you know, t-shirt and, and pants. She wore them to Boston and she got arrested for it. Um, skirts were another big issue. Um, so at this time, when um, say in the 1960s, when this real pushback that women shouldn't be wearing pants, you also had women that were wearing these incredibly short skirts. Um, so it was just kind of this strange dynamic um, and what experts said about it. And these experts could be anyone from, like I said, designers to religious um, folks um, to economists. Um, economists often said that the length of your skirt was a part of the economy. Um, and so you had this kind of growing acceptance of these mini skirts. And then um, over time, like often happens in fashion, you have the pendulum swinging. Um, women stopped wearing these short skirts um, and they started um, wearing skirts that kind of went down to, your, um, down to your ankle and they were called midi skirts. And um, people got very upset about the midi skirt um, because they had enjoyed seeing the young women's legs over time. Um, and so you had this real um, pushback. You saw people write, there were um, articles in the, uh, the fashion section saying that just can't happen. Um, and so I would say of anything, skirts were probably one of the biggest social issues of the time. Um, the others, not surprisingly, um, in the late 60s, and early 1970s were wearing bras. And so, um, this, of course, bras really weren't burned, but the concept was there, right? The pushing back on those expectations. And um, the, some of the stories um, that were in the fashion section were about economics, that you had these companies who, of course, for years, um, there used to even be brassiere editors in the fashion section, like that was their job, that was their title. Um, so you had this kind of push away from bras and corsets, and you had these, um, bra companies very concerned about what the future of their industry um, was going to be. So they started selling bras that you wore to make you look like you weren't wearing a bra. So it was this kind of you know dynamic that as things were changing and what we wore changed, um, what you manufactured changed and what that really meant um, because they were jobs, they were manufacturing, um, but those norms were clearly changing when um, you had a lot of women in the women's rights groups fighting not to wear a bra. And the response from the foundations company was, well, let's create bras and make you look like you're not wearing a bra, even though you were wearing the bra. Um, hats and gloves, of course, were significant. Um, and that's really um, another one of the big social chains that you see in the fashion section. Because forever, um, Men and women wore hats from a fashion history standpoint. President um, John F. Kennedy stopped wearing a hat, and that was um, either credited with or um, blamed, no matter how you feel about hats. Um, but there were also hat editors, right? That was something that um, your local community, um, the milliners were, this was something that was important that suddenly lost its way, um, as well as gloves. Many of the fashion editors said, um, even if they were going to write something radical or cover something in a significant new way, they still would have to wear lipstick and gloves um, to be taken seriously. That gave them a kind of agency that they could write about, um, even if they were kind of pushing against um, tradition. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos. Um, these two women were in that earlier photo I showed you um, in the women's section of the Miami Herald. Um, so they're wearing hats. Um, the woman um, on the left is wearing netting. Uh, they're both wearing white gloves, and this is in the summer in Miami. Um, you know, it's it's 
almost amazing what that must have been like. But if you look at the meetings of, say, the women's clubs, where often there were fashion shows, almost everyone had hats on and they had gloves, usually wearing high heels. So that tradition um, was there for a long time. But when it went away, um, there were glove sections and um, in department stores that were suddenly gone. Um, the milliners no longer had their hat businesses. So this was also a change that was not only social, but economic. Um, and really what we what we feel about gender traditions could be found in those fashion sections. So um, that's um, my stories um, from the fashion um, sections of newspapers. So the women's sections were largely gone by um, the late, 1960s, early 1970s. So the fashion sections themselves were gone. Um, the food sections kind of spun out. Um, we still see them sometimes here or there, although over the last two decades, they're kind of gone away too. Um, so the food sections were all women. They became, um, they became um, being edited by men throughout the 1970s, but those jobs still existed. Um, the fashion sections outside of say, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and um, the Washington Post were largely gone by the 1980s. And again, every major newspaper had at least one fashion journalist. So it really changed their industry. Um, of course, there were always uh, women's magazines, but what was important about fashion sections of newspapers is they're what we would call today as hyper-local. They knew the local department stores. They knew what the women wanted to wear. Um, they knew it was too cold for mini skirts um, in Milwaukee, but a great thing for Miami. Um, and so they really were um, a way that newspapers connected with their readers. And I think the loss of these fashion sections and the women's pages too, um, it really changed the relationship um, between the readers and their newspaper that um, I think newspapers miss today. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thanks. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat and uh, we can go ahead and share those with Dr. Boss. Um, I have a question actually while uh, we're getting started. Um, if I remember correctly, didn't Marjorie Canan Rawlings start writing for women's pages? Um, is that something that you're familiar with? She probably did. She's a little bit before my time. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas definitely, um, you know, started writing early. And, you know, obviously then it led to um, the Everglades. And she, if we kind of think of that model, though, the idea that you talked about the environment, kind of a Mother Earth kind of um, concept, meant that um, you had, you were allowed to say things you wouldn't about other topics, right? But if you're writing about the environment, um, that was okay. She was very good friends in Miami um, with Helen Mirror that started the library system in the state of Florida um, and was the later the children's editor of the Miami Herald. Um, and so it, it really was about how these women frame their activism. Libraries, the environment, you know, were kind of safe enough topics to write about that if they had take a, if they had taken a stand on more political issues, right? It might have considered too threatening, too aggressive, too assertive. Um, and so often it was kind of within that that realm that those concepts would happen. Um, and so you, you do see these, um, so, sometimes they would use their motherhood. Um, they would write about their role as mothers that said, okay, well then, if you're writing about what you care about in a maternal way, it's okay to be angry, right? The Mothers Against Drunk Driving is kind of a famous group that used that concept. It was allowed, you were allowed to be upset and assertive if what you were doing was caring about your family. Um, and so you see some of that kind of um, embedded with all of women's journalism for the most part um, in that 40s through um, the early 1970s. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat right now. 
think you had mentioned you had maybe a few additional yeah. nuggets to share with us. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> it looks like you've done a really effective job of answering the audience's questions. Oh, you're kind. Um, yeah, I, I, I think what was um, really significant that you saw have, happening in the 50s and 60s, um, prior to World War II, um, America had no real fashion of any kind. Like it's, it's hard to almost overemphasize that. The idea here was that Europe decided. They were the ones that would know um, what things would be in style and what wouldn't. And so um, when you had the destruction right, of World War II, all of a sudden it was a chance for America to find its place. And that's where I think sometimes, um, you know, we, we know that there was a, a big resurgence um, or a big coming up at the first part and then resurgence in California uh, of clothes. And of course, New York City um, had all sorts of manufacturing jobs that were that way. But in South Florida, um, there were um, fashion shows, um, there were designers um, that got their starts there. And then we hear about them later when they get to New York. Um, it was really the beginning of resort wear. Prior to a lot of what Miami was doing, um, there were only four seasons, the ones we think of. <laughs> and it, resort wear became the fifth. Um, and part of this was also um, with the growth of tourism in the 1950s and 60s. So you had people, um, I, I read about um, the stories where you'd have people that would come from the Midwest or out East and they would literally travel with an empty suitcase because they didn't, they weren't selling any of the kinds of clothes there in the wintertime, right? That we um, would have down here. And, you know, I sometimes feel like I hear the reverse of that when you hear um, Florida friends who are going to go stay home for Christmas, they can't find a coat down here, right? It was kind of that reversal of that. Um, but what I think sometimes is overlooked about fashion is what an economic boon it was for folks. Um, people weren't just coming down here to go on vacation. These department stores were suddenly, um, you know, selling um, lots of clothes for the first time. You had um, labor jobs, right, for women who sew, which is something, of course, we don't really even think about nowadays, right? Um, in fact, I've noticed um, recently a lot of community colleges, a lot of local libraries, particularly during the pandemic, um, have invested in um, sewing machines that you can check out like you would a book, um, which you know is the idea that you wouldn't have that at home. Um, when you look at what was happening in the 1950s, you literally went to your newspaper to find um, that pattern for what you would wear. And so there was this real connection to the readership. There were some women's page editors um, that would often kind of anger management by writing some kind of controversial articles. And in their oral histories, they've all mentioned, um, they knew that they couldn't get fired because their readership loved them so much. And so, you know, it was that kind of um, power in that way. Um, but this was a time when you would contact your newspaper um, for a recipe, you know, this is pre-Google, right? If you wanted to know how to make something, you contacted your newspaper and they would go into a uh, filing cabinet, find that and send it to you. Um, they would send you um, patterns. They would um, give you advice within the fashion section, um, almost kind of like etiquette, like what was acceptable at that time or not. And so there was a real connection between um, the newspaper and particularly the, the women readers. And again, I, I do think that was a tough thing. Um, the reason that women's sections left the newspaper um, was in large part um, women's um, women's rights groups, um, Gloria Steinem specifically asking to get rid of the women's section. Uh, again, as I mentioned, under the theory that these women would get jobs in other sections. Not only did they not get those jobs, um, these sections turned into lifestyle and many of them, most of them, lost their jobs um, in those positions at newspapers. Well, that's uh, definitely interesting to hear kind of about you know, the, the life cycle of these pages over time. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I still don't have any questions in the chat. So unless you have any more nuggets for us. I think that's <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed this and I hope that the audience did as well. Um, again,
Uh, please join us on April 2nd um, for a curatorial talk about our exhibit Trailblazers, 150 Years of Alachua County Women. That will be on April 2nd at four o'clock um, in person and in Zoom. Um, so we hope to see you there. And thank you again so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you. Take care.